This lecture will introduce the first major theory in the class, and that theory will be due to two economists named Harrod and Domer. Domer. Independently, they worked on this idea, a very simple idea, and uh, it's combined in the literature as the Harrod Domer model. I think it's a little oversimplified, and hopefully you will see that very quickly. But if you were to think of the invention of the wheel and how we got from the wheel rim on a horse-drawn carriage, not too far back, to an inflatable tire with shock absorbers on the vehicle so that if you hit a pothole, you don't even know that you hit a pothole. You will understand why some theories start out being very rudimentary, very simple, but by the time we get to modern thinking, we've advanced way beyond that. But the idea is what's important, and that's what we're going to focus on at this time. I would introduce you to a Russian guy named Vasily Leontiev, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on input-output models, among other things. But the logic behind the Haradomar model is Leontiev-type technologies. Leontiev assumed in the short-term planning schema that input-output ratios were fixed. The idea of a fixed input-output ratio works like this. Each computer needs one worker. You can't add a second worker to the computer and increase productivity. Only one person can work with that computer at a time, and therefore having a second worker would just be a waste of labor power. In order to get that second worker productive, we'd need a second computer. So let us assume that we have a large number of workers and a small number of computers. Many of the workers have nothing to do, and they would be better off leaving the situation because their productivity is zero at the margin, or alternatively, bringing in more computers would solve the problem. Another way to solve the problem would be to figure out how to have more than one worker work with a computer. There might be a way to do that, a little outside of the box thinking. So for example, if one worker could use certain functions on the computer and another worker use other functions on that computer at the same time, then maybe we would find a way to be more productive with that computer. In the context of developing countries, the scarce resource in their economy is capital, and that the abundant resource is labor. But these economies have many individuals who are available to work, but not enough machinery for these workers to all combine with these machines to produce output. Alternatively, you might have some kinds of machines, but the machines are not right given the quality of the labor investment in the economy. So the workers might not have the technical know-how to make the machines work, in which case you'd have to increase their educational level or their training level so that the machines can actually be productive. If you wanted to think about this in a neoclassical context, imagine the demand and supply for labor and capital. So we have the price of the resource on the vertical axis, the quantity of the resource on the horizontal axis, and I'm going to use vertical supply curves just to keep the analysis very straightforward so that the price doesn't influence the supply. Having a positively sloped supply curve will not change anything about the analysis, so the vertical supply curve will work just as well. And we have negatively sloped demand curves. So I say let's show an excess demand for capital and an excess supply of labor. So we have a wage rate that is too high, causing a surplus of labor, or alternatively a shortage of demand. Demand is smaller than supply. And we have a price for capital, or rental rate for capital, that is too low, causing an excess demand for capital. The Harrod-Domar model does not introduce the idea of prices, but in order to get a sense as to why there's an excess demand for one thing and excess supply of the other, the neoclassical mindset of prices being too high or too low can be helpful. Not necessarily, but can be. So since we are training economists, then you want to use all of the knowledge you have to explain why these things might occur. Clearly, for the neoclassically trained economists, you'd want to say that if you have an excess supply or excess demand, the easy solution is to adjust the price. That is the first best solution to excess demand and excess supply. Adjust the price towards equilibrium. In the context of developing countries, if you have an excess supply of labor, 
the solution, the neoclassical solution of lowering the price would mean that you lower the wage rate. When you think about the fact that in many of these countries the wages are extremely low, lowering the wage rate does not seem like a viable solution. So I'll use a phrase that my neighbor used when I was growing up. I had a blind neighbor and one of his favorite phrases was, when better can't be done, let worse continue. And while lowering the wage rate might solve the problem in terms of increasing the demand for labor, the individuals are all going to be worse off because every worker who was formerly employed will now be earning less in order to employ those who were unemployed. And we're not sure that this is actually the best solution. The amount paid by employers may actually go down. <laughs> it's possible if you can imagine that. So go back to the idea of Leontief techniques. And the Leontief technique would be shown in several ways. One way is to focus on what are called fixed input-output ratios. And uh, you can draw a production function with output on the vertical axis and input on the horizontal axis. Now, because we mentioned two inputs, we're talking about output a function of labor and capital. This is clearly going to be a three-dimensional function so you can't easily sketch the function. If we say that labor is in excess supply, then having more workers will not increase the output, so your production function in the short run, output against labor would be a horizontal line. Adding extra workers will not increase output. If you showed capital as your input, output against capital, then you would end up with a positively slow function. And you're saying that Increasing the amount of capital will increase the amount of output, partly because of the fact that with a fixed input-output ratio, you need for every machine, you need workers to be available. And we already said that there's a surplus of workers, so adding more capital will also cause more workers to be employed. And that fixed input-output ratio would mean that hiring more capital gets more output because there is excess supply of labor to be mopped up. In that context, then, the production function in two dimensions, output against capital, would be a straight line. We are assuming that hiring extra workers will lead to the same amount of output each and every time. I guess we're talking about constant returns to scale, so that when we increase the inputs, if you double the inputs, you double the output. Constant returns to scale is one of the implicit assumptions here. It is not necessary. One could have decreasing returns to scale, but constant returns to scale works just as well. So let's stick with that idea. We're now going to sketch what are called isoquants. Iso means same, same quantity. And the isoquant is shown as capital against labor. So the graph is capital against labor. And uh, the Leontief type isoquants would be L-shaped isoquants. And what this means is that at the corner, you would show a given amount of capital and labor. That's the ratio of capital to labor in the production process. And if you were to increase capital without increasing labor, you would get no more output. If you were to increase labor without increasing capital, you'd get no more output. So in order to get more output, you need to increase both capital and labor simultaneously. So we will show the ISO quant for any given level of output. And in order to show a higher level of output, we would show a new isoquant, a new L-shaped isoquant that moves further to the northeast. And therefore, we have this series of L-shaped isoquants. And the corner of the isoquant is the only point that will be employed, capital to labor in a fixed ratio. One of the engines in the Harrod-Domer model is that countries need to save to invest. And that investment will produce economic output or economic growth. Savings is the key then that drives the economic model here, the first key. Investment ultimately is the driver, but in order to invest, you must save first. We know that in practice, countries can borrow, so you don't need to save in order to invest. Not if another country or another institution is willing to lend you the money, you can borrow and then repay from your higher level of output. No one nowadays saves to build a house. We borrow and then we pay back over the life of owning the house. It's called a mortgage. But the simple theory at that point in time assumed that countries had to save in order to invest. And therefore, growth became a very slow process 
unless you could ramp up your savings or you could change the technique you were using towards a more capital intensive technique that would also help you to grow. So increasing your savings rate, switch to a more capital intensive technique. These are the two solutions to the model. Now you can look at the video lecture on the Harrod Dover model. So I would encourage you to pause this video and work through that particular topic. It should be safe for me to assume that you've actually looked at the Harrod Domar model. If you have, I'll quickly hit the high notes. The capital labor ratio is assumed to be fixed. The saving rate is also assumed to be fixed. The saving rate is the level of saving divided by the level of output. S equals little s times y and the capital output ratio is assumed to be constant. K equals little k times y. Y is output, k is the level of capital, s is the level of saving, little s is the ratio. So when you were to rewrite, little k equals big K on y and little s equals big S on y. We assume that investment is the change in the capital stock. So if you were to take the first derivative or take changes in the k equals little k y equation, you get delta k equals little k times delta y. And assume that delta k is investment, delta k equals i. Now we start to move towards this simple theory. Suffice it to say that we're going to have s equals little s y. So key to the model is the idea that saving equal investment. And since investment is change in K, we're going to substitute for investment change in K. So we have I equals little K times delta Y. And assuming that saving equal investment, we have S equal I. S equals little K times delta Y. Divide each side by Y, we get s on y, which is little s, equals little k times change in y over y. Change in y over y is the rate of growth of output. So the model boils down to the rate of growth of output equals little s over little k. Very simple model, oversimplified I would say, but it basically says that if you can increase your little, little s, your saving rate, or you can lower your little k, the capital to output ratio, if you were to take the reciprocal, so it would be S times the reciprocal of K, and the reciprocal of K is Y over big K, so that would be the output per unit capital. So if you increase your level of output per unit capital, which means you become more productive, the same level of capital can produce more output, so you get a new computer, and the new computer is more productive than the old computer with the same individual operating it without necessarily learning more so the technique has improved so you increase your saving rate or you get a better technique these are the two routes to increasing output I mentioned that the theory is a little oversimplified because one can borrow and therefore one doesn't need to save in order to get new investment at the time that many developing countries came on stream as independent countries they did not have the ability to save very quickly and therefore their growth rates would have been very laboriously, painfully slow. However, because funds were being made available, then ramping up your economy by borrowing was the faster way to get that increased output. Harrod and Domar did not consider this, but clearly as a criticism of the HD model, the Harrod Domar model, you'd want to consider that you can also increase your investment by borrowing rather than saving. So it's savings by other people, you borrowed savings, that can help you to increase your output. Clearly the borrowings have to be repaid, so you should not view that you've actually increased your output. So imagine a country that borrows capital or has foreign investors come to invest, and all the gains from that new investment belong to the country doing the investing. So your gross domestic product, what is produced domestically, increases, but your gross national product, what belongs to nationals, has not increased. So one needs to think that through as well. 
that the borrowing need not lead to increased national income. It might lead to increased domestic output, but that increased output doesn't belong to your country. We can get into phenomena known as immiserizing growth, a topic we will come to later in the semester. Growth that actually makes you worse off. You're growing your economy. It looks to others as though there's more economic activity. That economic activity is not redounding to the benefit of the local economy. So that's something to keep in mind. Growth does not need to make you better off. When I was a student in high school, one of the first experiments we did in biology was we took two seeds. We put one in a beaker with some cotton wool and put it on the windowsill. Obviously, you put some water in the cotton wool to help the seed germinate. And we put the second seed in the beaker with cotton wool and some water, and we put it in a closed cupboard with a little slit so that there's a little ray of light that could get into the cupboard. And after three days, we pulled the beaker with the, the seed from the cupboard, and we put it next to the one that was on the windowsill. The one that was in the cupboard was very long and yellow. The one that was on the windowsill was very short and green. Healthy growth versus unhealthy growth. I mentioned that as a by the way. Never thought that experiment when I was 13 years old would become useful, but it turns out to be useful in this context. So the Harrod Doman model is oversimplified. It doesn't assume borrowing from international context, and it also did not include depreciation. So you can in increase your capital stock, but it is possible that in increasing your capital stock, the new capital is replacing old capital and therefore you're not actually increasing, you're just replacing. Clearly, if you increase more than replacement level, then your capital stock will grow. But that's another caveat or warning about the Haradoma model. The original Haradoma model did not include depreciation. Many economists have fixed that. It doesn't change the final outcome, but in case you want to go on to graduate school and you want to talk about the Haradoma model, you need to have been informed of the criticisms of that model. So that takes care of the first theory, the harrod doma model. The simple idea in summary is that a country that wants to grow has to increase its savings rate, saving rate I should say, or decrease its capital to output ratio, improve its productivity of capital.